Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to be here. We were here about four years ago. It was just a, just a beautiful place. And, uh, but I particularly want to um, thank the husbands for dragging their wives here. Because um, you know how it is. Us guys, we love stuff about marriage. We love about, you know, we'll have a little, we'll have a little thing we'll do later, very awkward interventions. We have to talk to your wife about stuff. We love this stuff. And so what the wives often do to get them to come to this thing, they said, you like golf, right? Why do you think we go to Congressional? I'll take care of the details. And so you roll in and march, and you get a little suspicious. So thank you very much. Uh, she'd rather be watching basketball today. But you know, sometimes the man has to step up. You got to step up and say, we're going to go to a marriage training thing, because that's what we're going to do. All right. So great. So it's great, great to have you all here. I want to thank Father Hathaway. So, so Father Hathaway kind of covered, at least that's our take, of the absolute centrality of Christ being involved in your marriage. We'll refer to it indirectly, but uh, when we, if we don't talk about that a lot, it's only because it's been discussed and it's absolutely critical that you have a relation with Christ, to have a relation with your spouse and a relation with your kids. So you might allude to that, but I think I kind of said that box has been checked and we're all aboard on that. Lorraine and I are both aboard on that. And that also that um, love is an, is, is an irrevocable gift, the vocation of irrevocable gifts and the return of amazing graces that come with that. And then, and then I think uh, Dr. Gress really kind of nailed humility. We'll talk about humility more. You can't get beyond humility. And the more you know, your temperament, the more humble you get. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. But um, she did have a suggestion about uh, how to have more silence in your marriage. You just might want to do what my wife did. You just, for Christmas, you give your husband Cardinal Seurat's book on silence. I go, wow, this is an interesting gift. Thank you for giving me the book on silence that by, uh, by a cardinal named Sarah. That's great. OK, I'm all over it. And uh, actually, it turned out to be a good book. I read it. It's a great book. But uh, that actually generated some discussion <laughs> of the value of silence in our marriage. I still haven't totally gotten over that message. But anyhow, anyhow so, so that's one way to handle that problem, at least, as well. And I think also. Uh, what a great line by Dr. Ress. I'll, I'll talk about the melancholics later. For us melancholics, that was a great one. I, I'm just going to take this. The clean, this is incredible. Turning worrying into contemplation. That's worth its weight in gold there. Turning worrying into contemplation. So Dr. Ress, I'm, she's already gone. I wanted to ask her permission to steal that for the rest of the talks we give on this topic. So anyhow, well, she's not here. That's the way it goes. Anyhow, so God created us. God created us out of love for love. So love is the common vocation we have all of us, married or unmarried, single or priest, whatever. It's our primary vocation. Pope Benedict XVI wrote in God is Love that love is, quote, a journey, an ongoing exodus out of the closed inward-looking self, out of the closed inward-looking self toward its liberation through self-giving, just like Father said, and thus toward authentic self-discovery. As we give ourselves away, we discover ourselves, so says Benedict the 16th, and ultimately we discover God. So that process gives us the whole shooting match, gives us closer to God, self-discovery, and more love for others. What is authentic self-discovery? Why? How do we know ourselves? And why do we? By the way, why do we want to bother to know ourselves? Why do I want to know ourselves? Well, the saints are all over this. Pick your saint. We'll pick Saint Teresa of Avila. Quote: Even if we are taken up to heaven, because self-knowledge leads to humility. Boom. There's a humility again. And there can be no holiness without humility. She's kind of implying that this self-knowledge stuff even goes on in heaven, which is one model. It never ends. Maybe that's because it's a good thing. How, how do we, and how does knowing ourselves or our temperaments, that's our, one of the tools we'll suggest here, make things better? Well, in the marriage, again, we're going to talk about strengthening the spousal relationship. But our model, if we had more time, it would be that that is the best way. And I think Father actually said that. The best way to be a great parent is to be a great spouse, right? So he gave the example of going out on a date, leaving your kids behind with a babysitter who's going to overcharge you and just talk to your boyfriend the whole night anyhow. When you do that, you're actually helping your kids. Why? Because if you strengthen, if mom and if, if the husband and wife strengthen the relationship, that does trickle down to the kid. That's our model as well. And, and you want unity, the unity of husband and wife. And unity doesn't mean uniformity. This is a common debate all the time, you know. Unity is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's bigger than us. It's bigger than our machinations and our plans and our, our goals. But unity is a gift that we can get from the sacrament of marriage. 
where we start to become more closer to each other. It doesn't mean we're exactly the same. So the temperaments are a good model. There's other models. The one we're just more familiar with that has been very helpful for us. And for others, but as, a, as I'm a marriage therapist, I used to work, used to find temperaments very helpful with marital problems and marital strengths, is that it builds bilateral respect. Even though he or she is different than me, we can have common goals, maybe going after them different ways. Now, to, with the temperaments, you know, you're going to be leaning. Uh, temperaments really are how you tend to react in certain situations. It's very important to know that, I mean, as you go through life, because you're going to lean one way or the other. And most people kind of under stress or duress will either tend to blame, uh, it's others' fault, the world's full of horrible, whatever, or I'm horrible, and whatever. And, and always what we're trying to find in the Christian view is a third option. Not just blame. Sometimes blame is appropriate. No, not, we're not exercising it totally. Sometimes also I, I have to step up, okay? So I have to blame the world. I have, to, I have to step up. The third option, of course, is love. What we're trying to do is respond lovingly to most situations the best way we can. If we know our temperament, we'll know where we lean and will help us kind of guide us whether we're just caving into our temperament or making a prudent decision to be more loving. And we don't want to just have transactions in life, you know? What do you want? I'll give it to you. You got this. You got it. Good, good. Checked off. Boom. That's three minutes. That explains the three-minute conversations a day. That, by the way, that's the most depressing. I'm a marriage therapist. That's the most depressing number I've heard. Three minutes? Three minutes? Wow. Wow. Gulp. Okay. Three minutes. All right. So that's, that's just transactions. Pick them up. Drop them off. See you later, alligator. Well, here we go. And you can't make a, a marriage on that any, any more than you go, yeah, I'm a master. I'm going to go to the Eucharist, pick up some Eucharist, and come home. And it wasn't work either. So we want to get more heart to heart. And I think the temperaments are helpful. One quick comment, and then Lorraine's going to tell you about them. Temperaments don't put you in a box. Some psychological theories do. This one doesn't. It just tells you how do you tend to lean and react. <clears throat> Excuse me. You don't have to react that way, but it's good to, good to know how you tend. And since this is a Catholic audience, no Catholic talk is complete without at least one reference of Thomas Aquinas. So let me just get that out of the way right now, all right? And it was actually said earlier, grace builds on nature. By discuss discussing our natural temperaments, grace can be all the better. So I want to introduce my wife, Lorraine Bennett, to talk about the cleric temperament. I'm just going to put this in here. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I always like to begin with a confession. And the confession that I have to make is that before I knew about temperaments, I used to think that my husband, Art, was just like me, only bad. <laughs> so, so, then, so wh then when I learned about temperaments and I discovered that some of the many things that he did that I thought he was doing on purpose to annoy and harass me, um, these were actually aspects of his God-given temperament. So for example, he, he, was, he was just the opposite of me. And he would come home from work and he wanted quiet time and I, was, I wanted to talk. And of course I'd been home with the kids uh, you know, all day or whatever and so I just pounced on him. And, um, and he just, uh, like that was too much. And I thought, well, is he, now he's avoiding me and he's, maybe he's antisocial. So I thought there was something wrong with him. He's either antisocial or maybe he's angry at me. So he's angry at me and he's not talking to me. Or why does he not respond quickly? Well, it's just because of his temperament, which will c come clear as we're talking about the different temperaments. And, um, and so it's like we, we are using the, we talk about temperaments in the kind of the old, old school way of, um, it's been around for, for, many, many years, decades, um, millennia, I don't know, um, in the church, uh, there are many saints, and even one pope, Pope John Paul I, not the second, uh, and he wrote, talked about temperaments, and they discussed them in using the old term, the Greek terminology, the choleric or choleric, uh, sanguine, melancholic, and phlegmatic. So that's what we talk about, not that you... Uh, have to use those terms, but it's just kind of a handy, uh, handy kind of little tool to and, and way to understand ourselves. And um, we're really talking about the underlying reactions, as Art said, um, and we're not trying to put people in a box. Um, it really, it's the way we, we will understand better how to communicate with our spouse, uh, since our talk is about spouse, but also with our kids. It really will give us a handle on our kids. Um, that's why we also wrote a book on the temperament God gave your kids. Anyway, 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the choleric, or some people say choleric, temperament. Um, and then we're going to go back and forth, and we'll each discuss uh, one of the uh, two. We'll each discuss the temperaments that way. Um, so the choleric is your original type A personality. They have quick, intense reactions, which makes them decisive, tenacious, and driven to follow through. They are determined, energetic, forceful, and confident. And what you want to remember about cholerics is that they love to be in charge. Now, they don't have to have any experience in the areas in which they decide to take charge. <laughs> so Mother Angelica is a classic example. Um, she had absolutely zero experience in communications, and she builds the largest Catholic communication network in the world. Um, so they're fiercely independent, self-motivated, and strong-willed. They're sometimes accused of rolling over people once they've set a plan in motion, of being stubborn and demanding, opinionated, competitive, and argumentative. Now, those of you out there who are cholerics, you, th you'll know you are because that doesn't bother you. You say, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> so, for example, our... Our youngest child, thankfully, we didn't have a cleric first, but anyway, our youngest child is cleric, and um, and we were uh, I was asking her to help us uh, create this temperament test that's in the in the kid book, and um, so I was asking her to look over the these characteristics that I'd written and I'd put them in columns of stre of uh, strengths versus weaknesses, and she's reading through it and she goes, "Wait a minute, why is always right?" A weakness because <laughs> of course she thought it was a strength which you know fellow clerics that's what you <laughs> that's what we think we are always right okay so you know you ha you have a cleric spouse or child um, because they're the ones who are always debating everything you say and it's like it's just the way they process information so um, we just we argue about things that's what we do um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a, an example of a cleric, and he one time he, I think one of a quote that he said was, um, uh, "There's nothing I love so much as a good fight." And he would invite the uh, Republicans over for breakfast so he could have arguments over breakfast, and this is just like the great way to start the day with a good argument. Anyway, so so I'm so we're. Art and I are both, are, we're opposite, so I'm choleric sanguine and he's um, phlegmatic melancholic. So we're exact opposites. Anyway, so as I mentioned, our child, um, youngest child is, is a choleric like me. And so we would have lots and lots of, of arguments. And so I'm going to tell the Martian, have, does it, have I already told you guys the Martian story? If not, I'm going to tell it. Raise your hand if you've already heard this story. Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, I'll tell it. I love it. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Okay, so this is a story about my, um, so our youngest, um, and she allows us to use her name. I will use her name. Her name is Lucy. Um, in fact, she demands that we use her name. Uh, <laughs> um, and so we're both colleagues. One time, she was about 12 years old, and she was looking in the mirror, and she goes, Mom, look at the shape of my head. And I look at her, and I go, yes. She says, there's something wrong with the shape of my head. I go, Lucy, there's nothing wrong with the shape of your head. It's just fine. She goes, no, look at the way it's round behind my ears. I go, Lucy, instantly we are diverted into a debate at this point. I go, Lucy, your head is supposed to be round behind your ears. Why, if it was not round behind your ears, if it went straight back like this, you'd be a Martian. And Lucy goes, Mom, that's not what Martians look like. What are you talking about? Martians, their heads go like this. They go up like this, and then it's round at the top like that. That's what Martians look like. I go, Lucy, I am not talking about those Martians. I'm talking about the other Martians, the Martians whose heads go straight back like that. And then meanwhile, there's our son standing there, um, and he goes, I can't believe you two are arguing about the shape of Martians' heads because neither of you has ever seen a Martian. But <laughs> that didn't matter because we were enjoying our argument. 
Anyway, so that gives you an example of what a cleric is like. And St. Paul himself was probably a cleric. In Athens, Paul grows exasperated by all the idols. Quote, so he debated in the synagogue with the Jews and the worshipers, and daily in the public square with whoever happened to be there. <laughs> Paul even disagreed openly with Peter, the first pope. Quote, I opposed him to his face because he clearly was wrong. <laughs> in Acts, it says about Paul, quote, he even addressed the Greek-speaking Jews and debated with them. They, for their part, responded by trying to kill him. <laughs> and clerics sometimes provoke this kind of response. <laughs> so the fact is, clerics can stir up arguments almost in their sleep. <laughs> but experts in marriage uh, research have shown that it's not disagreements themselves that cause problems for marriage. It's actually how the couples fight, rather than the fight itself. What you want to avoid is, um, what is what's known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Crist criticism, contempt, stonewalling, and defensiveness. Um, and as Pope Francis also has pointed out, he said, dear couples, even though the plates may fly, don't go to bed without making peace. Now, clerics sometimes have trouble with this because as I mentioned earlier, they are always right. <laughs> so they really don't want to say they're sorry and make peace. Um, but this is where we really need to grow in the virtue of humility. And of course, there's always that, that necessity of growing in virtue. Um, so clerics tend not to like uh, communication skills. Or we don't want to learn how to communicate better. If everybody would just listen to us, everything would be fine. <laughs> Um, but one communication skill, and we're going to, because this is a talk about on for, cup, for spouses, um, we're going to focus on a, a tip or communication skill that each, uh, that you can practice later or even at this point right now. Um, and we're going to give you a, a, a communication skill that will enhance your marriage, but your communication, um, but also that really works with the temperament. So one of the one of the things that can be a little bit difficult for clerics is to be open to influence. And so that is because they're thinking, well, I'm right. I, I don't even need to listen to what you're saying or um, why should I why should I discuss this at all? Um, and the idea about being open to influence is that um, you don't have to agree with the, what the other person or your child is bringing up but it, you do have to listen, listen to it, um, and be open to hearing about it and learning more. So for example, a few years ago, out of the blue, Art said, um, he goes, I, I think I wanna do one of those backpacking things where they kinda drop you from a helicopter in the middle of nowhere, and then you kinda have to like guide yourself by the stars and get out of the, and I'm like, very supportively, I say, you're crazy. <laughs> So now, if you know Art and me, um, you'll know that I was speaking the truth. I mean, the last time we went camping, uh, we couldn't get the coffee to percolate on the Coleman stove, and so we left the kids in the tent, and we drove to a Starbucks. <laughs> so however, but what happened by my not being open, open to influence there, I just, I effectively cut off all communication right there. So I actually don't know, to this day, I don't know why he wanted to do that. Why did he say that? Um, but I shut him down on it, and that, that was the mistake. So um, what they found is that happy marriages, um, the couples are open to influence, and they're open to listening to the hopes and dreams of their spouse. So um, one of the things that we'd like to do is, uh, do we, should we do it? Okay, um, we're gonna we're gonna give you guys an exercise, and um, each if everybody has a partner, um, if you don't have a partner, find somebody else, <laughs> and then you you take turns telling the other person um, a, a hope or a dream that you have, and then the other person listens respectfully, 
and maybe ask, well, what is, what is important to you about that? That's what I should have said to Art. I should have said, well, wait, why do you want to do that? What is important to you about that? What, what would it fulfill? What need would it fulfill in you to do that? You know, so that's something that's very important that we listen. Um, and in fact, our last book is called Tuned In, and it's about listening. Um, 100%, that's what that book's about. <laughs> So um, let's let's give you guys like 30, 30 seconds to to practice with your with your spouse. Yes, always. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we should. The first shall be last. Maybe the the uh, let the let the other one go first. <laughs> um, but but try that. Okay, everybody, and then switch off. So you thirty seconds each. Did I do? Yeah. So you let them, that's yours. I was looking at that before. So give them a chance. So you should have got the dream by now, and you should have commented on it. Now, why don't you flip? If you haven't switched, just go ahead and switch in midstream, OK? All right, all right, all right. We can't go on. You guys talking all the time. we got to get moving here. Very good. Very good. Of course, any of these exercises can be, um, well, you can do it later, too. You can talk about your dreams later and be, in, and be interested. You got, you know, you're Catholics. You got another 40 or 50 years of marriage. You can get around to this stuff. It's very good. Okay. What? You're still talking. So is the previous speaker still talking. Here we go. All right. All right. Thank you. We always start our talks off with a cleric. I don't know why that is. <laughs> We've never not done that. I'd be afraid not to do it. So we got the cleric. All right, I'm going to talk about the phlegmat. Lorraine, is, she, she already confessed. She's choleric sanguine. We'll explain that. I'm phlegmatic melancholic. So we are, we are opposites uh, totally. Um, it was so revel revelatory for me when I realized that my wife's chronic arguing and debating about, as far as I could tell, everything <clears throat> all the time. By the way, did you notice the shoes Father Hathaway had on? He has the exact same shoes I have on. Well, I, I mentioned this. I'm sorry, you're getting involved in marital problems. I mentioned this because I'm always seen as kind of a sloppy dresser, which I confess that I am. Father Hathaway is seen as one of the premier, very neat. So we have the same shoes, baby. There you go. All right, so that's good. That'll get, that'll get that elephant off my back for at least 10 minutes. OK, good. All right, so, so clerics love to argue. And in a way, it helps you not to take it so personally that not every argument is just going after you or bringing you down. It's just the desire to debate and reflect on things. It's almost like if you married Chesterton, that's probably what would happen. It was just all the time. This was really helpful for our marriage because I did take this stuff personally. Every time she told me that she didn't like my tie, it actually still bothers me, to be honest with you. But I mean, that every, everything has to be commented upon because that's not how I live and that's not how I say things. I'm, a, I art, I'm an art fan, I'm a phlegmatic. And whereas, whereas roll through life, kind of on a conquering mode and winning and getting things done. And by the way, what a beautiful thing. We could use more of that in the church. Good argument can be made. More clerics in the church. Please apply. Why does the other side get all the clerics? Come on to our side is right. The phlegmatic comes into a situation wanting to fit in, want to be a team player, wanting to kind of make it harmonious, not triumphant. <laughs> what are the rules here? All right, I'll, I'll abide by them. But you don't even know what they are yet. Tell me and I'll abide by them. I want to kind of get along. And this is a wonderful quality. It's a very peaceful quality. So uh, firemen, diplomats, poker players probably, though they're probably closet clerics. Um, uh, oftentimes, the phlegmatics are dependable, polite, even tempered, sometimes quiet, docile, and obedient. We always say to Catholic families, if you haven't had a phlegmatic child yet, keep having kids till you get one. Because you want at least one kid that does what you say. 
You know what I mean? You go like this, and the, clear, and the phlegmatic goes, okay, Dad, okay, Mom, and you'll love that. You need one of those, okay, because now, phlegmatics hate conflict. So this is where it becomes kind of interesting. Cholerics love conflict. Phlegmatics hate conflict. So when you're, in the, when you're in that kind of emotional reaction, it's, it's important to kind of lean in and, and figure out a little bit. But particularly what phlegmatics hate is interpersonal conflict. I actually got up this morning, got a text from one of my colleagues at work, and he was telling me what he was upset about. And that, that hits right into my phlegmatic heart. It's hard for me not to respond to that or feel I need to do something. Actually, you don't need to do anything about it. It's really not my problem. But that's the temptation of the phlegmatic. Ooh, there's conflict. That's bad. Okay? So, so as a phlegmatic, a card-carrying phlegmatic, one of the great things that marriage helps with is tons of conflict. So you got to work on it all the time, okay? I'll give you an example. Our son, uh, a phlegmatic son, uh, came home from school, and he brought home the school pro uh, you know, um, program every two weeks that came out and told you what's happening at school. Because he was phlegmatic, he brought it home and gave it to his parents. Our other kids had just got it and threw it away and just went about their business. The phlegmatics bring things home, and they give them to mom and dad. And then I was looking at it, and I go, whoa. Say something about student body president elections. And I said to my son, would you sit down a second? Let's read this. So you know what he did? He sat down. Isn't this beautiful? He sat down, and we said, well, let's talk about this. He heard us talking about it. And he's like 16 or 17. And we came to the conclusion that maybe he should run for student body president. Lorraine is a cleric. goes, yeah, he should run for student body president. By the way, well, a lot, long story short, we suggest, why don't you run? And he says, OK, I'll run. He runs, and he wins. <clears throat> and then a very interesting thing happened in terms of his development as a man and as, as a person is that he, he found a lot of conflict. He was the most popular to get elected, but every day conflict. I thought you were going to change this. I thought you were going to do that. So he really grew up. Because the phlegmatics have to learn how to handle conflict, how to handle conflict. And also, you kind of realize as life goes on, most of the most peaceful moments of your life weren't just handed to you. They're the result of resolving conflict or some problems. Now, I, I'm a marriage therapist. The number one reason, most often given reason for divorce, isn't that we fight too much, though that's not great. Isn't we argue or scream, that's not great either. The number one reason, most frequently given reason, by spouse's divorce is there was some problem and he wouldn't talk about it. He wouldn't talk about it. Could have been, he probably was flight and fight kind of response. So not talking about problems, not really willing to kind of engage in conflict is, is not really the way to go. Phlegmatics also sometimes take the easy route. I'll give you an example, like when Lorraine and I go to the movies, um, so we're driving in the movies, and I have a bad habit, it's a phlegmatic habit, I'll just take the first parking place I can find. I don't wanna, quote, fight for a parking place. That's not a sport I like. It's a sport you like, it's not a sport I like. So I usually take the first parking space. So when we walk to the movie, it usually takes us about 20, 25 minutes to get to the movie. Um, <laughs> We see the movie, and then we walk back. Now, we just saw a movie, and one of the qualities about a cleric is an instant response. In fact, every DJ on the radio from 4 to 6 p.m. is a cleric. Because something happened today, and they're going to tell you exactly how you should think about it for the rest of your life. How do they do that? I don't know. They just do it. It doesn't mean they're right, by the way. It just means they do it. I'm a phlegmatics are kind of 180 off of that. I'll give you an example. When I go to the movie, we're walking back to the car. It's a long walk. We have a long walk because I parked the first place I found. And she's talking. She's breaking the movie down. The movie must be broke down right now. We just saw it. We break it down right now. Okay. Denzel Washington, I think this is one of the better roles. Maybe a better Philadelphia story. I'm not sure. The music was interesting. I like the way it was woven in. The dialogue was great. I didn't like this part of the thing. What do you think? So as we're walking, and I, she goes, what do you think? And I go, well, <clears throat> Yeah, Denzel Washington, yeah, I don't know, it was his best role, and I don't really think about it. Is it music? Was it a, was it a music? It wasn't a musical, was it? No? Okay, good. Just want to make sure it's the same movie. Okay, so pretty unimpressive. Pretty unimpressive. This causes sometimes marital conflict. I'm passionate about something you're not. Well, actually, well, I'll tell you. So the next morning, usually go to mass, uh, movie on Saturday, get up Sunday, and those days we had teenage kids, so they wouldn't w wake up about 10 minutes before mass. So we have the mornings to ourselves. We have the mornings to ourselves. Some of you might just want to let that absorb. It does happen. And um, I'd say, all right, babe, I want to talk about the movie. Now I want to talk about the movie. I have to think about it. I have to go kind of through the other Denzel Washington movies. And, so, and Lorraine goes something like this. What movie? That came, whistle blew, the train left, too bad. So, so when you have different styles like that, it can be radically misunderstood. And it's not necessarily that. It's just some people like to think things through a little bit. I'm not a DJ at 4 o'clock. I'll write an article about it maybe two weeks from now. I don't have to know 
everything about it now. Now, one of the key qualities in working with a phlegmatic is what I call the slow startup. Now, as far as I can tell, Lorraine is a choleric. We'll talk about anything, anytime, anywhere, and by the way, any place. We're, we're meeting new people. She just loves to bring up politics and religion. Just loves it because she wants to have a nice little sparring dinner. You know what I mean? Come on, let's see what we got here. That kind of thing. I hate that. I hate it. So I'm under the table. She has to get me out of the table. And um, all right. So one day, Lorraine said to me, um, "There's something you're doing that I don't like. I want to talk to you about it, but we don't have to talk right now. However, I do want to talk about it before we go to the Outer Banks." in about six weeks. I want it to be solved by then. This is after I learned about the temperament. So this is when I figured out that he didn't like having things sprung on him. OK, so this is when I've gotten mature. <laughs> Call this maturity? That's right, that's a mature. So we were taking a walk. Now, Lorraine strategically told me about this about the half point of the walk, which means you got to walk back. Um, so I said, so it's something really important I have to, you want to talk to me about. Are you saying, are you asking me, you want me to cue you when the right moment is to do that? By the way, Colin, that is the slow startup. I have something really important I want to talk to you about. Let me know when I can talk to you about it. I'm not going to spring it on you. I'm not going to ambush you. Now, clerics are clerics. They just ambush all the time, and that's okay. But when you have a phlegmatic or melancholic, no, I want to see, I want to know what the introduction says. I want to see the chapters. And, I want to see who it's dedicated to. Or I'm a therapist. I want you to pay for me $150 to listen to you. I want you to come early, fill out the forms. We're going to talk for so, so, so some of half of the world's like this, half the world's like that. So anyway, what happens in the course of this scenario? I go, um, OK, now's a good time. Tell me now. And that's so important. We used to, I like to use the example of, let's say you tell your boss, oh, hey, I, I'm, uh, can I make a, a point with my boss? I want to. Talk to her about something. What I want to talk to her about is I want to raise. So I set up the meeting for Friday at 3 o'clock. And when I come to that meeting Friday at 3 o'clock, I'm going to have my PowerPoints and my presentation. I'll get my arguments about why I think you should pay me more. It's a better investment in the company to invest more in Bennett. Okay, that's going to be my argument, right? But let's say I, I do that on Monday. Then on Wednesday, I'm in the elevator. Here comes my boss. Should I spring it on her then? Hey, I think you need to pay me more money. That would go. She'd hit the next button and get off. That would be the end of that, right? Same thing in marriage sometimes. The timing's got to be right, because this is important. So what Lorraine wanted to tell me, by the way, is we had made a commitment as a family to have dinners together. I work nights. So we set two or three nights where we don't come hell or high water, we're going to have dinner together. And then all of a sudden, a weird thing happened. I got transformed to em Emily Post. All of a sudden, I'm at dinner, and I'm cranky. They have to pass the salt with the pepper. Salt with the pepper. We discussed that. <laughs> No, you pick up the plates, pick up the plates. Help mom, help mom. So we have dinner together. Why Why do you have dinner together? So we could be a family, interacting. And, and be honest, I was angry about the fact that I was making all the sacrifices for this dinner thing. And I took it out because I didn't address it, right, by being so cranky. So Lorraine wanted to talk to me about that because she didn't want to go to the Outer Banks and have this happen. So she told me on this walk, uh, I love you. You're a great guy. You're horrible Emily Post. Stay off of that. The whole reason for the dinners was to be very harmonious. I'll worry about the salt and pepper in the dishes. You just worry about kind of being present and helpful. What a great comment, right? And every marriage has to be able to have those discussions. So that's a slow startup. That's a slow startup. So we're not going to do an exercise in that because I went over and so next, yeah. See, this is very common, by the way. I just made a decision. And it's been overrided by the choleric, just like that. So this is the temperaments all the time. Um, no. Go ahead, go. Sanguine. OK. Do I get to do an exercise? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Wait. Um, OK. We'll tell you how to do that exercise later. How's that? So OK. OK, so the sanguine is the next. So remember, we were talking about um, what kind of distinguishes the different temperaments is the reaction. So the choleric is the intense, quick, and long-lived reaction. The phlegmatic is the not intense, not um, long-lived, not immediate reaction. So that's why they're the even keel, and the choleric is the very strong reaction. Well, the sanguine is the 
intense, quick, but not long-lived reaction. So as a result, they are very, they tend to be the sort of people who are very impulsive and very um, enthusiastic and very um, energetic and active, but also forgetful. Um, also, they tend to be the one who comes, you know, comes late, arrives late, you know, forget where they parked the car and where their keys are and whatnot, but they always have a really funny story to tell you about why they're late and you forgive them. Um, so the sanguine is your classic people person, the life of the party, fun-loving and affectionate. They're eager to please and love to be the center of attention. They have quick, intense, but short-lived reactions. They live in the present moment. Um, so your sanguine child, if you have a sanguine child, they're the ones running out of the door, but then they have to run back in three times because they forgot their homework, they forgot to get the note signed by the parents, they forgot their gym bag, you know, et cetera. And now they're not doing this to be on purpose, like, you know, just to do this to be bad, you know what I mean? It's like they're just, they just are this way. This is kind of the way they're hardwired. Um, they love people, they love being sociable, they enjoy life, unlike the choleric who's like dominating life, and the melancholic who you'll find out next, and they're suffering through life, or worrying about life. <laughs> um, they enjoy life, and they love life. They have lots of friends and lots of activities. They're sociable, spontaneous, and scattered. They're like butterflies that flit from flower to flower, from one interest to another. In school, they join lots of clubs, but they forget to attend the meetings. So we had a sanguine son who, in high school, he signed up for almost every club. Uh, and then he forgot to show up to any of the meetings. But he did show up on picture day. <laughs> we were looking through the yearbook, and we're like, wait a minute. You, what are you doing in the math club? You know, with chess? Do you play chess? Wait, I know you don't play the violin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But he showed up on picture day and he said that's what counted. <laughs> Saint, Saint Peter was a lovable but inconstant sanguine. Quote, Lord, I'm prepared to go to prison and to die with you, he fervently pronounces. A few hours later, Peter denies even knowing Jesus. At the transfiguration, Peter enthusiastically offers to set up three tents on the spot, even though, as scripture notes, he did not know what he was saying. When Christ appeared walking on the water, Peter impulsively joins him until he begins to sink. Sanguines are wonderfully generous, open, and forgiving until the going gets tough. And that's when the sanguine wants to go shopping. Remember St. Peter trying to talk Christ out of the cross, right? So that's a classic sanguine moment. <laughs> um, as an example, so as I said, I'm part sanguine. Um, and, and so... There's this uh, every year at the in Virginia in in the Arlington Diocese we have the an annual women's conference, and there's like 800 women show up for this thing, and um, and I love this conference because I get to see all these ladies that I haven't seen all year, and then I see them once a year at least at this at this conference, and so of course being part sanguine I sign I sign up to vo I volunteer you know I'm gonna I'm, I'll help out me. Huh? Um, and um, so what I'm hoping for, and what happened this one year, a um, couple of years ago anyway, uh, so I got signed up to work the registration table, you know, when people come in and they, you know, you, you, you give them their name tag and you give them their little packet of stuff. And Well, I love this because I'm like, oh, I get to say hi to everybody I haven't seen. And I'm going to sit next to my friend Beth and we're, she's, we've got our coffee and I'm, you know, and we're chatting. And I'm like, oh, hey, Sue, I haven't seen you in a year. This is so great. Here's your name tag. You know, and I love it. It's so awesome. And we're having our bagels and our coffee and chatting. And then the woman who is in charge, she comes over, she goes, Lorraine, I need you to monitor the confession line. And I'm like, no! <laughs> now, I don't have anything against confession. I love confession. Confession is awesome. And there's like 15 priests that come to this thing, or 20 priests, I don't know. And there's and it's like awesome, and you get to go to confession. And this was, you know, during Lent. And um, anyway, but I didn't want to monitor the confession line because we had to be quiet. We couldn't talk. And I couldn't say anything to anybody. We had to be, shh. The confession line was upstairs. 
and there was this long hallway, and we had to keep track of the doors and which priest had a door open, and I could say, wait, you may go in. Father Smith is available now, and I had to be quiet, and I'm like, oh, I can hear my friends down there talking. <laughs> anyway, so that's an example of being a, a sanguine who they, we, you know, we want to be where the where the party is, right? <laughs> um, however, I came home from that, I, it, and I I told my I told Art, you know, I said, well, I did it because you know, well, it is Lent, and I offered it up, and I told him the whole story, and and he goes, oh, I would have loved the confession line, because <laughs> of course he would have loved it. <laughs> um, but so because sanguines have this way about them and it's you know it's a virtue being this you know the the you know life loving talkative person but it can also cause problems it, you can fail to listen that's a problem um, so that's one of the the things that in in a marriage that we want to encourage those of you who are sanguine to listen also and it can be hard sometimes like especially if somebody if we're talking about something that is kind of hard to talk about or um, we are there's a problem and we need to discuss it in our family. The sanguine wants to like, oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. Let's let's just go shopping, you know. Let's just have a wine and cheese party, you know. We're we're just like, let's just make it nice, you know. Um, so, but the thing is, in marriage, we need to sit down. As Art said, we need to have these conversations. We need to talk about problems, and um, and we need to talk about conflict even. Um, so one of the exercises that we were thinking you could try is to um, talk about is to is is to discuss a well. It's better not to discuss an actually explosive topic or anything here, but we'll just do an imaginary topic, and you can you can try with your partner. You can you can share a a concern, but not a not a real concern. Like just to do something, you know. I, something silly like, um, let's see, you promised you would take me bungee jumping off a cliff in Mexico and you still haven't followed through. No, or just make something up. And then the other person, the partner, will listen em empath empathically and then say back to you what, what you're, you know, what you just said. So that would be an example of empathy. Um, is that right? Did I explain it correctly? Okay, he's he's the therapist. I shouldn't be doing this. I mean, <laughs> that's an example of being cleric. Like, <laughs> I'll just do the thing. No. Um, okay, so you guys get to you get to practice this with your partner. Pick a topic. Don't pick a like terribly explosive topic where you're gonna have a big fight and then you'll leave and we won't be able to finish our talk. Okay. So, but pick a, a mild topic <laughs> and um, and share what a concern and then your partner will repeat back and say how you feel about it. So in other words, they heard what you said and this is how you feel, right? Okay, so that everybody gets to try it out right now. Go. <laughs> I can't tell which is yours and which is mine. Oh. This was like this. Oh, sorry. This one was like this. Is that mine?
Okay. About 30 seconds. You guys are really being good sports about this. It's great. Appreciate it. Um, and all this can be addressed later. You know, you can have the big issue or the minor issue, or whatever. Um, one thing I do want to say about empathy: empathy does not mean you agree. Uh, and maybe this is more for the guys. It doesn't mean you agree. It just means you you understand. And it also doesn't mean you have the same feeling. If, so, if your wife or husband tells you about how upset they are with their boss, and you want to hear that. Those are the kind of things you want to talk about. But you, you might not be as upset if your boss did the same thing as it did to him or her. But before you say how you would react, you want your spouse to feel like you got it. You understood what, he's, what it's like for him to put up with this or like for her to put up with this or how really hurt you were when I came a half hour for late for dinner, I, I thought you were disappointed. You didn't sound disappointed. You sound like you're really angry at me. You're really angry at me? So you're really, really angry at me because I came late and didn't call. Do I have that right? Now I'm thinking, well, I had the traffic. I mean, you don't want my boss. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. But, oh, okay. Because you need to know in your marriage if you're dealing with disappointment or you're dealing with anger because the intervention is totally different. <laughs> okay. A disappointment is, yeah, don't do it again. Give me a mwah, mwah, I won't. But anger, you know, uh, you know, you might have to go to a nice restaurant and buy a bottle of wine and let's get to the bottom of it kind of thing. You, know, you have to invest in that. So it's really important to know. And I was kind of showing with the temperaments, there's just certain ways we tend to react differently. You can tell already Lorraine uh, has, a, has a wider range or different range of reactions to situations and stuff. I also want to be clear, too, you can change. And, and, and uh, I guess she said that as well as, as Father did too. When we acquire virtue, we can overcome the weaknesses of our temperament. So we don't, she just talked about the sanguines. Well, the sanguines don't have the market on happiness, though they tend to be more naturally happy, more naturally uplifting. Uh, but, you know, all of us want to be happy. Our cholerics aren't the only leaders in town. All of us want to lead. So let me talk now about the fourth temperament. And like Lorraine said, we use kind of the old school terms. Uh, the, the people studying temperament at Ivy League and stuff don't use these same terms we use. They use more like impulsivity and reacti reactivity. But the last one is the melancholic. Whereas the sanguine is outgoing, optimistic, eyebrows raised, enthusiastic, the melancholic can be more cautious. Sometimes it's taken to be pessimistic, but certainly generally more serious. This is important. I remember the person that wrote the letter to Southwest Airlines and she said, I don't like the fact that your stewardess and stewards make fun of crashes and putting on the seatbelts. That's a really serious thing. And the president of Southwest wrote back and said, well, that's not the way we look at it. We like to have people have fun, so why don't you just go for another airline? That's just the way it goes. Because at Southwest, humor, or I guess a sanguine approach, is vital. And it wasn't that person who thought that was disrespectful. So you get this sometimes. I'm not saying that, that it's an open season for disrespect, but some people see things differently, the way they handle it, the way they kind of interact. The sanguine reacts quickly. That's a good idea. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. Whereas the melancholic wants to think it through. I want to think it through. It's funny, as a therapist, and I've pretty much been in the business of managing therapists pretty much my whole professional life, they tend to be melancholic. I mean, People might think, wouldn't a therapist be a happy-go-lucky kind of person? No, the happy-go-lucky kind of people don't become therapists. So, so this, the therapists tend to be pretty melancholic. I mean, you can talk to people who are depressed all day long. It, it takes a certain kind of stamina, a certain kind of interest. But um, so anytime I have a staff meeting with my melancholic colleagues, all right, and I have a new idea, they ain't going to like it. I, I haven't even said what it is yet. It's new. We don't like new. We just don't like new, particularly new from you, Bennett, that kind of thing. So um, I'm their boss. They don't like bosses either. So whenever I have an idea for a melancholic, you got to understand that if you force them to make an immediate decision, it'll probably just be no. No. Because mm -mm. mm -mm. mm -mm. mm -mm. I haven't thought about it. 
And there's nothing wrong with not thinking about things. The art culture is kind of hyper dynamic and hyper hyper responsive. So so when I do have to idea to my melancholic staff, I usually go stuff like this. Listen, I have a new idea, and I'm not, I'm not sure how you guys are going to like this. I want to give them room because they're going to be grumpy. Um, and I don't want you to make a decision right now. I just want you to think about it. And they do like to think about stuff. In fact, they're very thoughtful, very thoughtful as a temperament. They, they read poetry they, more than other temperaments. They, they read books. They write books. They read books and stuff like that. And they like long discussions and stuff. So I said, just think about it for a couple weeks. I won't even bring it up to staff meeting next week. Think about this idea, put the idea out, we'll talk about it in two weeks. And I find in about two weeks' time, they've, they've kind of thought about it, then we can get kind of a level playing field and we can talk about how constructive it is. But if I force it on them and push it on them, the cleric says, push it on me! And the melancholic goes, you push it on me, I'm not against it. So that's where temperament's helpful, because some of you have melancholic kids, and some of you have melancholic spouses, and you gotta, you're really enthusiastic and you present it, and it doesn't quite have that pizzazz you want, and you get all feeling sorry for yourself, and like, oh my god, oh my god. It's really not that. It's, some, it's more of a style thing that, that is that way. Melancholics, as far as we can tell, are the most loyal temperament. If you're friends with a melancholic, you're friends with a melancholic a long time. Once they, they tend to have fewer friends, the sanguine will tell you right off, here's how many contacts I have on LinkedIn, here's how many people are my friends on Facebook, and they're my friends on Facebook, and they'll go down the list. Of, and the, where the, the melancholic might say, well, I don't really do Facebook too often when I do. I just kind of cruise through it. I don't know how many friends. But melancholics are more quality than quantity, more deep, deep. A lot of Catholic uh, saints, Lorraine talked about you know, St. Paul, likely cleric, St. Peter, likely sanguine. I could have talked about St. Thomas Aquinas. He seems to get a, lot, a good rep as a phlegmatic. The Dominicans just, he was a Dominican. He's got to do what he's told. He said, you're the most brilliant man that ever lived. Keep writing, keep writing, keep writing, keep writing. He goes, yes, 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 that's what he did. So um, but the melancholic, there's so many saints they're probably melancholic. And it's not because saints like to be sad or whatever. They do embrace, as it kind of came up with the two previous speakers, it'll probably come up later. You have to figure out what to do with pain and suffering. You have to figure out what to do with it. There's some embracing it and working out on it with Christ. It's more that they are more naturally deep. And the Catholic Church is particularly a religion that really kind of caters to a depth. Maybe that's why we're kind of unpopular now, where everything's kind of glitzy and, and pizzazz and, 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 and wham bam, that's kind of thing. In, in our culture, maybe some of our Catholic strengths, more melancholic strengths, are not, not as appreciated. But nonetheless, um, mel melancholics can also, like I said, they don't always like new, because new's different, I have to figure it out. Melancholics actually read standing operating procedures. Uh, every company has them, and 90%, 75% of the time they're put on a, on, on a bookshelf and never looked at again. They're written by melancholics for melancholics. I know I have a new melancholic employee when the first day they go, can I see your procedures? And I go, sure you can. I'll be right there. I, I call another melancholic. We must have them somewhere. Can you give them to them so they can read that and then we'll get back to business because it's so important. Well, if you're walking down the aisle of a Safeway and there's someone in the middle of the aisle reading the side of the cereal box, the little tiny print, and wanting to know what's in there, um, I'm a betting man. You can put your five dollar down. That's probably a melancholic. I want to know what's in everything I'm eating before I eat it. I, I, that kind of thing. So the great attention to detail. Um, but sometimes it's hard to make a decision. I'll give you an example. One of our melancholic kids came home from college, and she had a job. The job was to uh, get uh, ID student IDs at the health. They have health clubs and stuff. Okay, so they would come in on the middle of campus, and lo and behold, there's students at the school, and they would show the ID. Okay, and she would check that off. You know, the kind of you know college jobs, which are not real jobs. You don't know what they call them. Anyhow, so she would do that, and um, so she came home for Easter. I guess Easter was March or April, whatever it was that year. And she said, you know, <clears throat> she'd been working this job since August. I'm thinking that I might start working out. Now she's been uh, going there four days a week. The weights are there. The yoga pads are there. The bicycles here. And she's thinking about maybe. Maybe I'll start working out. So August, September, October, November, December, January, for seven months thinking about that. So I don't know if it was Lorraine or I, one of us said, whoa, whoa, don't go so fast. <laughs> if you check with your doctor, if you're able to work, you know, kind of thing. Um, sometimes melancholics will things go 0.9999 for a long way before they kick into one. You know what I mean? They're just uncomfortable sometimes pulling the trigger and making a decision. I find melancholics, you've got to give, and I'm a, I'm a I'm a phlegmatic melancholic. You've got to give yourself a deadline, a hard deadline. A decision must be made by this time. I can only research this thing so much. I can only go on Google and read everything about it so long. I've got to make a decision. And now, that, it's not a bad thing. It's just a tendency that there's never enough information 
uh, on things. Melancholics also can kind of be overly concerned, maybe our culture invites this, that things are kind of going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, things are going to hell in a handbasket, so, so what do you do about that? And it's tempting to be very discouraged, very down, it's hopeless and all that kind of thing. Um, now there's some things that are very discouraging, <coughs> don't get me wrong, but if that really kind of becomes the color of everything all the time, then that's not as helpful as well. I mean, or, or is that the most prudent way to, to look at things? Now, I'm going to talk about a communica communication trip, trip, tip that you could trip on, by, for particularly geared for the melancholic. Now, there's been some studies on marriage, and we refer to the Gottmans. <clears throat> they were the ones that wrote the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Um, we would recommend the Gottmans. They have, they have hard research and data on how marriage works, and uh, <clears throat> we need the spiritual and the natural kind of integrated grace on nature. But anyhow, they did a study of happy couples. Happy couples in Seattle, Washington, okay? A little bit atypical, perhaps, but. And here's what they did. They wanted to say, they, they interviewed these people, put the other spouse in the waiting room. If you had to marry the guy or gal again, would you do it? Yes or no? Are you happy? Yes or no? And a few other questions. So then they got all the happies and all the unhappies in categories, and they followed them around. The Gottmans are great at getting research grants to study things about marriage, because they're really kind of one in a field of one. They really take a look at it. So the graduate students would follow these people around, for days or weeks or hours or whatever, and watch their behaviors. And they discovered one quality of all the happy couples, and this quality was in none of the unhappies. Now, you don't get that kind of stuff in social science very often. It's like, whoa. Well, let me tell you what it wasn't. The happies did not have better health than the unhappies. Oh, if I was healthy, we'd be happy. Well, I don't think, but probably not. You're unhappy before you're, <laughs> before you're before your health problem, you'll probably be unhappy after, if you're happy before or after. It doesn't seem like it makes a difference in happiness in marriage. Another thing that wasn't a discriminator was money. Now, there's an exception. If you were on the bottom 10%, <clears throat> you know, that group of people that never seems to rise as our culture gets more expansive and interesting, though that 10% on the bottom, 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 that we actually work with the Catholic Charities, uh, it does have an impact on the happiness of the marriage. If you're starving and you're, you're fighting for a buck every day, that has an impact. But generally, above that, the other 90% hardly makes a difference for happiness in marriage. If only I made XK more, we'd be happier, babe. Well, if you make XK more, that'll be easier and better. I'm not sure we'll be happier. That's what the research shows. Curious. Now, from a biblical point of view, we shouldn't be terribly surprised that health and money <coughs> are not the source of happiness because we have this a different source of happiness. Right? Relation with Christ, doing the will of God. I'm not sure the Gottmans asked that. But anyhow, here's what they found was this. <coughs> the happies had a ratio of five to one positive comments to spouse over criticism. Now, it's one of the thing about the unhappies. I know we go over here and apply that she's unhappy. She's really happy. Boy, is she a happy camper. Uh, the unhappies, sometimes, this is kind of mind-blowing. Sometimes the unhappies this had a three-to-one ratio of positive to negative. It's like you're unhappy. You go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, for every time I give her a zinger, and she deserves it, I give her three compliments. And it doesn't work. It can be unspoken, too. Like if you have a melancholic husband. I assume he's thinking nice things about me right now, right? It could be a pat or a smile. Right. Okay, so that's a good point. It could be the, the bowl of soup is put in front of you. you go, wow, that counts. That counts, yeah. So now, all right, all right, well, okay, typical therapist stuff, got it. Big happy smile. Got to kind of have a fake smile around the house. I got to like all sorts of stuff I don't like. Uh, no, it's harder than that. You got to look at your spouse. And you gotta like what you see, and you gotta tell her. I can't tell many guys I've seen in therapy that thought marriage was to be interpreted. The most common one was this: I work like a dog. I'm working like a dog for you, so you can get into a nice, nice Catholic school in D.C., and your mom can have this big house. You don't think that's love? And they both go, huh? We don't. I made a mistake. That's why the, so the divorce court's coming down and taking you away, big guy. You made a major mistake. The mistake was the following. I'm doing this, babe, because I love you. I love you. I'm working late tonight because I want you to go to visitation, and that will turn your life around, 
and I would love you that much. If you don't have that narrative, well, you might not get the deal. You might get, it might not work. In fact, it happens. So here's the task, and, I'm, and we're talking with the melancholics. Is the hardest thing for us melancholics is to be overt about appreciation, because you know, <laughs> whenever you have a manager, they say, "Why should I thank them? They should have done it." You go, hey, you fellow melancholic, give me five, yeah. That's how we see the world. However, nobody else sees it that way. So we're going to go thank them. Come on with me. I want us to go thank them together. Let's have a thanking party. Thank you. They should have done it. I don't need to thank anybody. That's how melancholics think. Now, if the whole world was melancholic, there would be no Hallmark cards. They'd be gone. But thank God it isn't. So, so here's the thing. And by the way, this all comes from Christ, right? He's given you a marriage. He's given you a spouse, the endless sleepover for 50 years, no way, way out, right? He's given you this person you would completely die for. You, you can't, you must acknowledge that. The same way when Augustine ta talks about God in the confessions, talks to God in the confessions, he prefaces it by stuff like, you are a mighty God. You are incredible. You forgive me. He starts with that, and then he goes with his petitions or his comments. We don't want to be quite that grandiose with our spouses, but according to the Gottman study in Common Sense, we do want to say stuff like, God, you know, what a great mom you are, or how hard you work. I get on your back as you come home late, but just let's take 30 seconds for me to tell you how hard you work and how grateful we are. Or how did I ever get a Catholic husband? And they're like, I just read this thing. There's like 0.001% of, of the men out there are good practicing Catholics. How did I get one like you? Come on, baby. That's kind of thing. If you don't do that, then remember the man who's going to marriage therapy and talking to Bennett and thinking that he'd been sending out love signals, and all they interpreted was, he likes to work hard, he's a, he's a maniac. <laughs> wah, wah, right? And here come the divorce attorneys, they say, we'll take care of this. You had your moment, we'll take care of it. So, here's the exercise. I want you to tell the other person five things you really like. Now, this is not a time to run out of ideas. Think Tommy gun. Boom, 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 boom. Make it up if you have to. You can explain later. You like my sweaters? I'll explain later. <laughs> I beat you. You let me wear horseshoes? We've never played. I'll explain later. Okay. So uh, let's have the women start first. We'll give the guys the time to think about it because we need it. They can, they're working on their cheat sheets right now. If you guys are smart, you're making the list. All right. No, it should be sincere. Let me tell you five things I love about you, and the other person you can respond with a kiss, or okay, you can stick around, whatever. Markets, okay, women to the men. Market set, go. Five, quick, boom. All right, you should have already finished that. Very good. All right, let's reverse. Five things I love about you. Marcus Echo. All right, that's that great? Now, you, this could be continued. This could be continued like all the time for the rest of your life. One thing, by the way, because the melancholics in the room, I know what you're thinking, I'm a melancholic. When you say nice things to your wife, it doesn't mean you have to stop criticizing the rest of your life. You'll always find time for that anyhow, but there's no relationship between um, I'm mad at you right now so I can't say something nice, or I'm frustrated right now, but you know what? You are beautiful. What a great mom you are, and gosh, I love that French onion soup. Nothing wrong. So, so you want to have that created in your family. And when you're seeing your husband or wife awkwardly do this, then just love it because it strengthens your marriage and happiness. So anyhow, so we've just discussed the temperaments. From our view, our temperaments are literally a gift from God that God gives us. He doesn't give us the whole shooting match. He gives us some things easier. Sanguines can see like, like more light. Melancholics can go deep. Cholerics can take leadership roles. Phlegmatics are more cooperative. These are gifts he gives us. We can't park with that. We love it. It's a great gift. Then we want to cry our virtues to continue to keep growing 
all the time. Um, I like to, we like to end with a quote from St. Catherine of Siena. She has some chats with God. What's the business of chats with God? So had St. Catherine of Siena. So she asked the question we're always dying to ask. Why didn't you just give us all the stuff we want and need? Why must life be like this? And God responded, because he, he did that with her. She asked, he responded. What a relationship. He said, if I gave everybody all the natural virtues, they lose their soul. They would lose humility. They wouldn't realize they need other people, and they would, die, they, they would lose their soul because of pride. So our weaknesses are our biggest strengths. Thank you very much, you guys, for being here today and hearing us out. God bless you. Both have it equally. Uh, actually, phlegmatic is the most risk averse. Uh, melancholics actually will, will, will talk about problems, get into it, but they just don't like to have it thrown at them. I mean, they, they, they will talk about problems. <laughs> melancholics will talk about problems. Yeah, I didn't mean to mi misunderstand that. Now, are you saying if you're both the same temperament, the husband and wife? Sorry, I, I guess I'm also saying with, I, mean, I should have said conflict averse. I often find it hard to tell their kids, like a melancholic phlegmatic, if that yeah. conflict aversion. Do both of those temperaments share a similar aversion to conflict? In this regard, I think melancholics do think about, worry about uh, problems, but they often need to be invited to talk about them. Okay. Choleric and sanguines are just ready to talk about anything. So sometimes you have to make make a structured situation like, listen, is something bothering you? Can we can we talk about it? Or you go out to dinner and say, there's something important I want to talk about. Is now a good time? Or anything Yeah, with the kids, like especially the melancholic – is less conflict averse than the phlegmatic. I think that's what you were asking, yeah. right? Yeah, and they, but they're internalizing it. You need to bring it out so they can talk about it. Okay. Yeah, or give them a safe environment in which to discuss. Yeah, so they, they will discuss it, but we used to, like, we'd have to, with our melancholic, we would, when she was little, we would take her out, like, special thing, special dinner, special tea, special something, you know, just the two of us, and then you can talk and feel safe. So it's kind of like that. Okay. Yeah, um, what mistake made by managers and parents sometimes is, well, if they're not complaining, they must be happy. If that person you're talking about is a sanguine and they're not complaining, they probably are happy. But the other three temperaments you're going to have to ask. You just have to ask, like, yeah. Well, Choleric will probably tell you, too, because they'll tell you why they're, they should be your boss and why they're, how they're going to take over the world and a coup d'etat schedule for next Tuesday. Yeah, they'll tell you. But, but I mean, with, with phlegmatics and melancholics, you do need to ask and you need to structure it so that that can come out, and ideally in a healthy way. And uh, now, if, that's, if you're a phlegmatic and melancholic, it's going to be hard to do. You've got to kind of brace up, get on your knees, ask Christ. You know, you're always asking Christ, is today the day that I turn the other cheek? Or is today the day I turn over the tables? You tell me, and he'll tell you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I've heard in the past that most people are one true temperament, and then something happens, especially in childhood, and they'll kind of take on another temperament. Um, I just wondered if you guys could elaborate on that, or if most of us are truly a combination of the temperaments. We think everyone's a primary and secondary, choleric, sanguine, blah, 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 blah. Um, Trauma, which is becoming almost as common as the cold these days, trauma does kick things in differently. You can be a really outgoing, sanguine, fun-loving kid, but you've got an alcoholic dad who says, be quiet. It has an impact. It can thwart the natural desire to grow in the way God wants you to grow, and that's why those things are a problem. Uh, so trauma... We work with, with a lot of refugees at Catholic Charities. The poor thing, some of them come with such trauma, you've got to deal with the trauma. So trauma does, it has to be addressed first before we, we kind of roll into the land of the temperaments because it, it just is a more fundamental reality because it's a, it's a fear-based. You, you grow up fear-based and distrustful. And you have, but, but as an adult, you've got to 
got to work on that. You got to get trust back and everything. But it is important that temperaments don't trump some of these horrible things that have happened. Yeah, that's a really good point. Does that make sense, kind of thing? Yeah. All things being equal, temperaments are very helpful. Yeah. But if you just want to find out what your temperament is, and there's and you're, there's not an issue of trauma or whatever, um, there's temperamentquiz.com, and it's a quick test online. You can do that. You can put in a fake email address if you don't want to put your email address in there. Any any other questions? Is there any relationship between parent temperaments and child temperaments? Yeah, well, I think so. We think it's hereditary. It's kind of like a hereditary thing um, because it's a more of a biological. It's a natural thing. So we think it's kind of like the way you're you tend to be wired. Remember, it's not your whole personality. It's only that aspect of your personality of the reaction. And so you could, like, for example, um, my mom was melancholic, card carrying. 100% melancholic. So how, how did I become a choleric? Well, I looked at my grandmother, and she was definitely choleric. So I think it's like that. It's like, you know, you could, it was, you know, your grandmother could have red hair, and your mom didn't, and then you have red, you know. It's, so I think it's kind of like that. Th that's my theory. But is that good? Okay. <laughs> Anything? Any? Um, are you seeing an exacerbation of temperaments in fights among couples due to technology and cell phones, or are you seeing a numbing of those temperaments well, that's because of that? Question. <laughs> well, I, I think technology in our culture does push things into the choleric sanguine mode pretty, pretty aggressively. Same way we used to live in Germany. We thought we were a melancholic heaven. Uh, you know, because the values there were so melancholic in Germany. Our, our values here are going very strongly choleric. I'm on top of the world. I'm the man. Leave me alone. Uh, and and sanguine. What a what a gas. What a great time. All that. So I think a lot of uh, everything's getting pushed that way. The problem is everything isn't that way. And then that's not the only way to be. But mo most cultures do prefer one temperament over another. So if your temperament's not kind of in sync with the culture. You might feel a little bit out of place, but I think this kind of chronic emphasis on everyone has to be choleric, sanguine, happy-go-lucky, outgoing, dynamic, and stuff uh, is really missing a big, big piece of the human pie and, and, and the people that contribute and stuff. So that's a danger. The other thing is that technology is also kind of moving that way. I don't need to read the whole book. Just give me a few ideas. I can absorb it. Just let me skim, 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 picture, skim. That whole technology of this is the way we interact, it's almost overtaking like when we say transactions are overtaking encounters. So that's why I think Pope Francis talks about encounters all the time, because he sees it around the world. I, it's no longer the heart-to-heart -heart thing. It's, what do you got that I need? Give it to me good. See you later. Gone. Next, 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 next. P marriages can become that way. Kids become that way. Just tell me what your coach said. What did you get on your grades? What's going on? There's no time to eat. There's no time to talk. We've got to move, 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 move. Now, if you're in a war and a battle and you're a cleric general, that might make sense. But we're not always that way. So that's the biggest fear, really, I think is that the, the tone of our culture is repressing certain things we need, like, I'm going to read a poem tonight. That's going to take a while. Or I'm going to work on the math problem. If I don't get it done in three minutes, I'll see if I get it done in nine minutes. You know, that whole thing. Kids who spend nine minutes on math problems turn out to be mathematicians. Kids who spend less don't. That kind of it, lingering. Ling we're not a lingering culture. We're not a reflective. This is by Cardinal Sarah, that great book my wife bought me. He's trying to argue for silence in a culture. You know, every bar you go to is noise, noise. So, uh, there is a fear of, of drowning out the soul and the heart. So that's a melancholic take on it. Okay, thank you. God bless.